Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Kato. Hugely humbled to be here today. I'd like, as a farmer's son, to introduce some of my research. I never thought I'd become an academic, I just wanted to be farming. But I found something magical, and it's a great day, not only for me and all the people that work for, with me, but also for physiologists. I'm going to talk about rice grains, and I'm going to talk about medieval archers. I think we all know somebody in our lives that has suffered from cardiovascular disease. Certainly my parents and all four grandparents died of cardiovascular disease, which is motivating for a research scientist, a discovery scientist like myself, to try and better understand. And Graham, the previous speaker, said beautifully, if you get the understanding wrong, the intervention is hopeless. I'm going to talk to you this morning with a couple of examples. First one is high blood pressure, or called hypertension. One in four of us will uh, become hypertensive. And the disproportionate numbers of people in this country with hypertension is really astounding. And this is something that urgently needs addressing. More remarkable is the statistic that 50% of treated patients remain hypertensive. Surely, one size does not fit all here. We need much better understanding of why blood pressure increases because the effects that blood pressure have are catastrophic. We've discovered a novel sensor in the body which is the size of a rice grain. And it's in your necks, you have two each side, it's called the carotid body. And what it does is it senses the oxygen levels in the blood. And if the oxygen levels fall, from a physiological standpoint, you need to raise blood pressure in order to better perfuse the brain. The other important thing I want to tell you is that it connects directly to the brain through a small nerve, and that's allowed us an intervention. And we started to work on this in animals. We've used a genetically pre-programmed animal model of hypertension that mimics some of the features of human hypertension. It's a small rat. And what we've done is we've disconnected the carotid body from the brain as a proof of concept to understand whether or not this organ controls high blood pressure. And you can see clearly here from these recordings of pulsatile blood pressure before and after that carotid artery, sorry, that carotid body is disconnected from the brain, the blood pressure falls. And this was the first time that we'd realized that this organ is involved in the generation of high blood pressure. If we, rem if we make that same disconnection in an animal with completely normal blood pressure, there is no change in blood pressure. Something changes in the carotid body that signals to the brain to raise blood pressure in a pathological way. Of course, this is just an animal model, and really the acid test is to repeat that study in a human, and we had the opportunity to do that in 16 patients that were resistant to their drug medication. They were on five medications, they were resistant, and they had blood pressures at a similar level to the, to the, to the, to the rat. 200 millimeters of mercury systolic um, is, is life-threatening. It will cause stroke. You can see in the humans, when we remove just one of the carotid bodies in those patients, a very nice and respectable fall in blood pressure of around 25 millimeters of mercury, which in most cases persisted for six months when the study ended. And this therefore highlighted the importance of this organ for a generation of high blood pressure. The idea we have then is that the carotid body somehow develops hyperactivity, shouts to the brain to raise blood pressure in a pathological way. But what we next wanted to understand is what generates this hyperactivity within this little organ. To cut a very long story short, it actually is due to something that is released from the carotid body called adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy molecule, but it's also a signaling molecule that acts on a specific receptor, a protein, uh, called a P2X3. It's a purinergic receptor. This is just jargon. It doesn't matter. But the thing is that it's highly selective to these communications to the brain that controlling blood pressure. We formed a collaboration with a small pharmaceutical company in the United States to form a P2X3 receptor blocker to actually block that transmission to see if that would lower blood pressure. And lo and behold, Hugely satisfying. Yes, it does. It does lower blood pressure, again, by 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury in our animal models. 
We want now to translate this back to human, and we know in humans, this is cadaveric tissue of carotid body from patients that had high blood pressure, that that receptor is present in the carotid body of humans. And so now Merck have bought afferent pharmaceuticals and are running an ongoing clinical trial to test whether or not that drug will lower blood pressure. And I don't know the result yet, but as you can imagine, I'm very excited to find out. If it doesn't drop blood pressure, then my career is over. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> give back the pen. Wait a minute, the story's not finished. Because if, if, you, if you study cardiovascular disease, it's not just about hypertension, right? We know there are other things, many other forms of problems with cardiovascular system and disease. And I want to focus finally on heart failure, very briefly to tell you something very exciting that we've discovered with heart failure. Again, look at the Murray Pacific inequity here, something that we'd love to know more about um, in, in our Murray Pacific populations and to try and work out whether or not our carotid body might benefit, whether or not what I'm going to tell you now might benefit. Heart failure, there is no cure, there are no drugs. The drugs that you're given only slow progression. We focus not on drugs this time, but on devices, pacemakers. This is where the medieval archer comes in, because when you release an arrow, if you want to be accurate, you must always release on exhalation. Because if you breathe out, your heart rate slows and softens. And that, as you can imagine, every pulse, your arm, when extended, will move. But if you breathe out and slow your pulse, you can get much better accuracy. And of course, the Olympians do this with rifle shooting. This is just a schematic that it shows in green inhalation, exhalation, breathing in and out, and your heart rate will go up and down, up and down, every breath, under resting conditions. This is a sign of good health. Unfortunately, in heart failure, you lose that heart rate variability. It's gone. Does that matter? Pacemakers, if you're fitted with a pacemaker to try and improve the pumping capacity of your heart, do you reinstate that variability with breathing? No, it's completely metronomic, maybe at a slightly higher level. Does that matter? Well, we think it does. Of course it does, or else I wouldn't be telling you this story. <laughs> but the question is, how do we reinstate breath modulation of heart rate to reinstate that beautiful, that's nature's pacing. That's the way nature paces the heart. So we have had to design a novel device, which is a bionic device, it's bionic because it listens to the breathing and in turn stimulates the heart. So it knows when you're breathing in and breathing out to up and down your heart rate every breath. And we've done this in a sheep model of heart failure. So these sheep are in um, level three heart failure, which is fairly severe and very typical of many um, patients with heart failure. And you can see below in the pink trace Every time those signals go up, that is inspiration. And the, and the superimposed over the top is the black is the heart rate, which you can see very nicely dips immediately after you've breathed in. So as you start to breathe out, your heart rate falls. And that is being controlled by the device. And we can change the amplitude um, to produce deeper troughs in terms of lowering your heart rate, if we wish. We've connected the, sh the sheep's diaphragm, which is the main muscle of inspiration, to the device, and then using a, just a normal pacemaker lead, have fitted the pacemaker lead to command when that heart beats relative to the respiratory cycle. And this is the slide that I'm most excited about. In green, we have those sheep that were paced with that modulated heart rate. And in red, are those sheep that were paced with monotonic or metronomic pacing, which is the conventional clinical way of pacing. And you can see that in green, those that have the variable pacing produce a 25% increase in heart pumping efficiency. Finally, we know now why the heart is being modulated by breathing, because it increases the efficiency of the heart. The best that the, can happen clinically in heart failure is somewhere between 5 and 10% improvement in heart pumping with optimal drugs and a pacemaker. And this is clearly two and a half times greater already. This will lead, I very much hope, to a trial in Aotearoa, 
beginning in uh, uh, early next year, and we hope to have sites both here in Wellington and also in Hamilton. And we will recruit, we're raising money currently, we formed a spin-out company, which you have to do in order to get people to, do, to pr pr produce the funding to conduct this first inhuman trial. And this again will be very exciting, and again I put my neck on the line. So my summary is that I've been motivated by the discovery of novel mechanisms of bodily function and hopefully my aspiration is to help communities to improve the health and well-being of people with cardiovascular disease. The P2X3 receptor blocker may become the first new drug to target high blood pressure for 19 years. We haven't had a new drug to target blood pressure. That's, that's the hope with that one. The respiratory modulated pacemaker would be the first device that we believe would reverse heart failure. And that's what we're beginning to see in the hearts, is that we are reversing some of the damage that's being done through this modulated pacing. It's a huge honor for me to speak today and become a fellow of the Royal Society. And this, of course, is an ambition that's just come true for me. But this ambition, uh, sorry, this, this um, award as people have said before, is due to many people, and, and uh, this is just some of the people that I could have listed here. This reflects the hard work of many, many people that I've been so fortunate to have met. And now, um, uh, having moved to Auckland, I have an incredible team of people um, that I'm working and in, interacting with and who are being very supportive. Maintaining my international collaborators and my, my very importantly, my mentors, that have helped to train, train me over the years, all the way from my undergraduate degree. And then, as I call them, my home team, um, my wife, Julia, who's here, <laughs> who's been very supportive, I have to say, um, <clears throat> and my two children, Sebastian and Ava. And then, of course, there are my parents, who are no longer here. I want finally to thank Peter Hunter, because Peter was one of the reasons that I moved to, to New Zealand originally, because of the wonderful opportunities that are here in this country for doing this type of research. And I've just shown you some of the reasons um, f for that, because it was incredible to be able to uh, come to New Zealand and to be worked with such an incredible multidisciplinary team that has allowed us to drive our discovery science towards the clinic. Thank you all very much for your attention. Yeah.